So, hello and welcome to my presentation about predicting activities of daily living using machine learning and home assistant. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, quite honored to speak at this event. I'm a long-term home assistant user. I guess I started using it back then before async was introduced. And yeah, so thank you for that. I'm, I'm Chris, I'm a student a computer science student from the south of Germany. So I'm going to start with a pretty controversial statement about home control versus smart home. So don't take this too seriously. In my opinion, um, most of the smart homes as of today are still only home control because we're using devices such as smartphones to may, um, control other smart devices simple automations like dimming lights in the evening or using a thermostat for um, temperature control is still only control and also using a voice assistance to control your devices. Well, it's in the name, it's still control. So what then distinguishes a smart home from home control is I think the property of devices responding to what an inhabitant is doing in an intelligent manner. So what does a smart home user do? Well, it's activities of daily living, such as eating, sleeping, cooking, and so on and so forth. Um, and what is the response of devices? Well, in terms of home assistant, it is automations. So we see that from this definition of a smart home, uh, it gives natural rise to smart home um, having to be able to do human activity based automation. So let's just assume for a moment that we were able to automate based on the abstract concept of automations. So we could do really cool stuff like if a person was waking up, then a home assistant could read the morning uh, to do list to me or we could do stuff like when I'm coding and 40, I'm 45 minutes in, home assistant could automatically uh, deliver a cup of coffee to me. So how would I traditionally approach this? For example, if you want to do the automation, when I'm brushing my teeth, uh, home assistant should play my favorite song. And after maybe three minutes, it should say something in, at the lines of, well, congratulations, you're finished. <laughs> and well, I would first of all install a motion sensor in my bathroom. And then I would define the time I'm most likely to perform this activity. That also only should trigger once. Uh, maybe I have a different routine during the weekdays uh, in, in contrast to weekends. And we also have to account for flatmates that don't share this uh, habit of playing songs during brushing your teeth. And brushing teeth is not the only activity I'm maybe I'm performing in the in the bathroom. So you see where I'm going. The conditions pile up pretty easily, and the worst part of all, it just doesn't work. After three false positives, you turn off the um, the automation and you scrap the thing. But I still want to do cool automations like this. And uh, a wise man once said. You should not have to adapt to technology. And I think this is in particularly true for automations. So what to do? Um, why not use machine learning in order to predict probabilities corresponding to activities using the device readings of Home Assistant? Oh, shit. So, um, what did I do in, um, sorry. So, next to already smart home devices I owned, I installed um, uh, monitor stations having equipped with infrared sensors and 
distance sensors. I distributed them around my smart home in such a way that each of these monitor stations captured a certain area of interest, like the, um, the bathroom, my sleeping area, and the dining area. I then let Home Assistant record a lot of activities and annotated um, my own activities with an Android app so that I have start times and end times labeled with activities. So this was the whole architecture. I used, an, uh, you already saw the Android locker. It was connected to a REST web API and I used a small web interface to control it. Um, I could also launch a machine learning model on a dedicated real-time node that was connected to Home Assistant via WebSockets um, that notified the real-time node if there was an event. And the real-time node used the machine learning model to predict, well, probabilities corresponding to activities um, for a, the person integration. And I have a video right here. So, uh, so okay, here I have started a model and here I have um, my person integration and we have activities and um, the corresponding probabilities of me performing that activity. And I, yeah, so if you paid close attention, the transition between these probabilities were pretty inconsistent and um, seemed random and it is because they are. So how can I, sorry, I have to, ah. Sorry for the hiccup. Okay, um, this is because, uh, well, it didn't went all as planned. So, but let's get into the details to know what went wrong. So I am, I am presenting a state of home assistant as a binary vector. So a data point corresponds to such a state for a given point time t in time. So this is a normal event stream that you're seeing. And well, we could then just move forward and assume that all these data points are independent and there are models that handle these, this data pretty well like support vector machines or random forests. Um, then there are other models that just assume the data as it is, um, namely continuous um, temporal points, like the temporal point process or the Chinese restaurant process. I choose to discretize time and use model that perform um, inference on such a basis. So how do you discretize time? Well, you, um, divide your time slice, it, you divide your event stream in equidistant time slices. And instead of assigning um, state vectors to events, you assign state vectors to each of these time slices. So here's the model I used. Uh, it is a hidden Markov model where we have hidden unobserved states corresponding to our activities. We have probabilities of transitioning between these states. And within each state, we have an own probability distribution of emitting observations like this. So for example, this would be a pretty unlikely observation having all lights turned on in the state sleeping. I then compared this model to um, a dummy model. Um, you do this because you want to see if your model is, has learned anything. And the dummy model just sampled from my observed activity distribution. So we here see um, 
the all the activities and their durations and this is outside activity and sleeping are the most dominant activities and the model would just sample from this distribution so it just says a lot of time hey he is outside or he's sleeping and with, it will get a pretty decent accuracy um, so how did my model perform well it was worse than this model um, this is because well this is not so um, surprising because a hit Markov model can only look one time step back in the past because of the Markov property and this is in the case of this time slice of six seconds, not that much. So I relaxed this condition by using a hidden semi-Markov model. But again, this model was uh, performed way worse than a dummy model. So if this thing happens in uh, machine learning, maybe it's not the models, maybe it's the data. So I took a long break from the project, but then resumed to it and well, to look at the data and here we can see all event triggers of the devices um, for one day summed up over the whole period of time. And what you may notice, these are all motion sensors and this sensor in particular is, well, <laughs> just going wild and messed up the data. So what did I learn? Well, you always have to look at the data and this would have been good to know uh, before tediously labeling um, your activities for one month. So the next thing is how to choose devices. What you can see here is the on and off duration of each device divided by the activities. So for example, we have a, the bedroom pressure, a bedroom bed pressure map met, and it is we can see that it's almost exclusively on for the activity sleeping. Uh, almost the whole time the person is sleeping in total, namely 5.2 days. And this is pretty good. We want um, the devices to be like this. And if we look here at the uh, main door magnetic sensor, you may think this is also a good device because um, the, again, <laughs> the probability of the sensor being on, given that the person is sleeping, is almost one. Um, but the sensor is pretty bad because it is only on 3.3 minutes of uh, whereas leaving has a duration of 1.2 days. So in terms of mutual information, observing the sensor really gives me nothing at all. So let's take a look at my data set. <laughs> uh, we can see that almost, well, it is pretty bad because they all have the same color here and here. So all these devices are worthless. Some sensors weren't even on um, for a particular time. And all these sensors that may seem interesting suffer this property that they have no mutual information. So, well, um, we should choose devices that change the state exclusively for one activity. And we should also choose devices where the change state duration approximately, approximately matches the activity's duration. So, um, okay, there's only, I'm going a bit over time with, um, with this one plot, but I guess that's okay. So I looked at a lot of data sets and, and they all have this one plot in common. What, what does this plot show? Well, it's, well, this bar means that there are 600 events in my whole data set that have a succeeding event in roughly about one second. So what does this whole blue histogram mean? The, the huge fraction of my devices have the property that they have a successor in very short amount of time. And few devices, um, that there's nothing happening at all after we observe an event. So this is not surprising because, well, if you're walking through your room and um, there are a lot of motion sensors, we would expect this characteristic. But what is the consequence? For example, if we look um, for 40 seconds, we see that 75% of all devices have a successor device in less than 40 seconds. Um, and if we choose a time slice of 40 seconds, 
and all these devices having this property, it is very likely that we have multiple devices falling within a single time slice. And remember that we can only assign one back, um, state vector to a time slice. So we destroy a lot of information by choosing large time slices. So discretizing data may be not a good idea. Where does my journey go? I will, I think other data representations are better like uh, continuous time. I will be recording more data. And yeah, so of course there's also an add-on which um, guides you through this process of collecting data, visualizing it so you don't repeat the mistakes I made when I'm um, when I recorded the data and you can go to the fun part of modeling right away. 